John 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. So what does that mean? In the beginning was the Word. So what's the situation here? What's, what's happening? Well, read on. So John 1, 1. And the Word was with God. Alright, so here we see that the Word is in relationship to God somehow. So when creation happens, so that's the connection John's making with that phrase in the beginning, because that's how the Bible starts out, isn't it? In the beginning. So they're the first words in the whole Bible. So at the start of everything, this Word was already there. And the Word was with God. Okay, so this Word, what, is it a thing? Is it a principle? Is it a force? What is it? So read on. And the Word was God. Well, hang on. So this, you have this Word who is pre-existent, uncreated, and there with God the Father, which means he's distinct from him, right? He's with God, so you know, if you're with God, you're distinct from God. Because you can't be with someone and be them at the same time, right? That's illogical. But here we see that the Word who is with the Father, with God the Father, a, a separate person, but in the last phrase it says there he is God. So he's distinct from God, but he is God. So, for those who know, what Christian doctrine have we just encountered? The Trinity. Correct. Well, two members of it anyway. So, there's the Holy Spirit as well, of course. But yes, the Trinity. The Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit are all one God. But three persons within the Godhead, the Trinity. Now that is clearly something we can't fathom in its entirety. We've just showed you it's, it's illogical in a sense, but... This is who God is. He is an eternal relationship within himself. So he is love in essence. Now that's who he is. He's love because he's in a relationship. And he's life in essence. He's eternal. So he's the source of love and the source of life. And guess what? The good news is, is, is he wants to share that love and life with us. With you and me. But how is he going to do that? Well, he started out by telling us all about it through his various messengers in the Old Testament. So there were angels, there were prophets, and there was the written word. But at the right time, God did something different. And you might sense I'm heading towards Hebrews 1 here. Hebrews 1, 1 to 2 tells us about this. So if you have your Bible, please, please turn there. Hebrews 1, verse 1. And two, actually. And this is how the book of Hebrews starts out. So a lot of the stuff I take today is from the first, very first parts of the book. Hebrews 1, verse 1 and 2. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son. So you know, this is a big change. Instead of telling us about himself through a variety of sources... Now he did a once-for-all statement by sending his son. But hang on, if you send your son to do the job, that's not the same as you yourself doing it, is it? Well, no, not normally, but again, that's where we're talking about the Trinity, isn't it? That's, it's God in three persons. And this is where our understanding as feeble humans falls down. As created beings, we cannot fully ex grasp the truth of who God really is that he's Father, and that he's Son, and that he's Spirit, all three. So here we have the Son, who we we'll generally call the second member of the Trinity, you know, as, as a person. So that is what John is very eloquently explaining to us at the beginning of his Gospel. So I'll just go back to John 1. So remember, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now we need to get behind you know, the, the weight of the, the term the word here. What, what's that all about? So in the prevailing Greek culture of the day, it was, it was a big and deep word, this, the, the, the word, or the big idea. It's the Greek word logos. Um, you've probably heard logos before. If you've been in a church for any length of time, you probably have. 
Um, but to the pagan Greek mind, it was a title given to the great impersonal intelligence and the guiding force behind everything that exists and all the order in the universe. And the Hindus have a related concept called Brahman and other religions have their versions as well. But to the Hellenized, that means the Greek influence, culture, into which John's letter would go, which is where we're reading from here, John 1. Um, see, this, this principle of logic and reason and order was called the Logos, but it was just a principle. So we see that John is coming straight out of the gate with this idea to the people he's writing to. You know the Logos, that thing that orders everything you see? He's personal. He's God. He's absolutely responsible for ordering the universe, yes? And he's all powerful and incredible. But guess what? He's not unknowable. Makes you think of you know, when Paul was there saying to the unknown God, he says, I'm going to show you who this unknown God is. It's kind of that kind of idea as well. So you might think that Logos is just a force or principle, but he's not. Notice I said he's not. He's a, he's a person. In fact, are you ready for the greatest truth there is? This is John pretending to speak to it. So skip down to verse 14. This is the greatest truth in this bit. John 1.14 And the word, the Logos, became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, this is if you try and get your head around this, it might explode, okay? So just watch out. Now, th this is the heart of the Christmas message though, isn't it? This, this is what we need to to sort of get this if we're going to explain the reason for the season, as we say. This word, this logos, this reason, order, creative force, is in essence, in his that actual being, he's personal. He loves his life, as we saw before. And now for the first time in history, back when he first came, this essence has become human. This incredible power and love and truth and reason is now permanently and perfectly combined into human flesh. God is now man. And he lived among us about 2,000 years ago in Galilee and in, in Judea, there in modern day Israel. So he willingly limited himself geographically. And he willingly limited himself chronologically, so in time as well. So he was now in time and space. I'm trying a little box around that, so he's put himself in a box, sort of. Um, even though in the beginning, by his nature, he was beyond these two things, but he entered voluntarily. So we see all things through the lens of time and space because that's all we know. Okay, so this is why we have trouble comprehending some of these ideas. But the Logos, the Word, Jesus Christ, he's ultimately outside of time and space because he created it. As God, he is uncreated creator. So really, Jesus was there at creation? Yes, because how does the Bible describe how God the Father created everything? By his word. So over six days, he brought everything into perfect order. Now, yeah, we messed it up in Adam and Eve and, and everything that's gone on from there, but, but it was perfect to begin with. And that perfection was brought about by the operation of the Word of God. So John tells us that the Word became flesh and he lived here on earth. Now humanity could interact with God in person. And his actions and his words and his decisions were all in perfect alignment with the character of the Godhead. And now that way and truth and life, as Jesus described himself, don't you remember that? He's the way, the truth and the life. He was now embodied and brought to us so we can know him and love him. And now, so think about how this truth was embodied. So I've got a picture of sort of the, the, the manger and everything there. So he came like that, didn't he? He didn't get beamed down by God as an adult, you know, and do his job and then re retreat back to the safety of heaven to let us all figure it all out. Because, you know, if, if we were writing this story, I suspect, you know, how would we have a saviour to come? You might, you might sort of say, now, we're talking about God here, so he deserves special treatment. We need to look after him. So we'll just get him to, like, spiritually take over an adult person 
a good, a good adult person, of course, at some point, and then he'll live a good life and he'll be rich and he'll live in the best houses and then, and then he'll sign off and that'll be it. And he'll take care of salvation that way. But that's what we might think in our minds, but no, that wasn't God's plan, was it? He came down as a baby, which includes the nine months um, before the birth, of course. Don't forget, it was God then too. And Mary and Joseph were poor because they were stuck out with the animals when, when Mary gave birth. And when they came to dedicate Jesus, they had to have the, the cheapest sacrifice. That's all they could afford, we presume. So it was just the bird, whereas he could do other things. But So we can sort of see that Jesus was in a poor family. So is this the way we would describe the origins of a king if we were writing the story? Not normally. And God could have done anything he wished. He's God. But we see here the humility of our Lord. So Jesus came as a baby, born amongst the stinky animals, and his first bed was an itchy feeding trough. Imagine laying down in that. And don't forget, Mary and Joseph would have been considered adulterers as well. So, you know, sure, Mary, the Holy Spirit got you pregnant. Mm-hmm. That's what you know. people would... No one's going to believe that story, are they? So... Jesus would have been known as an illegitimate child as well. So life would have been tough for him. In that culture, it was, you know, you got picked on. But you see, God doesn't want anyone to claim that, you know, God, you just don't know what I've been through. No, he does know. He knows what tough times are like. And if you have any doubts about that, I'll just bring up this picture. How many of us will die with our friends all completely deserting us? And then being whipped and nailed to a cross to bleed and suffocate to death. No, none of us can claim that, you know, we've had it harder than Jesus. And that's just the physical pain. There's nothing to do with the spiritual pain as well, which we know nothing about. So he, he understands what pain and suffering is. And he did it all because he saw that the end was worth that pain. And what's the end? A love relationship with his children in paradise. That's God the Father. So, in a way, the worse things get on earth, if you think about how tough things might be, the worse they get on earth, that's just even more evidence of how good it must be in the end, right? I don't know if you've ever used that logic, but if, if such a mess and insult to God can be tolerated by him, because there's a lot going on that insults God, I probably don't need me to tell you that, then he must have some pretty amazing stuff lined up for us to justify that, to make it all worthwhile. And that is the kind of thing the Bible teaches us. So I'm going to go back to Hebrews here again. Hebrews 12 verse 2, that's where it's talking about Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So there is joy set before Jesus. And the great news is that joy involves us if we're his children. He wants us with him. Remember, God with us. It's all being together. And that will be joy like we've never even dreamed of. We've certainly never experienced anything like it. And that's pretty awesome. Because I know that God can dream up better stuff than I can, so dream the best you can and it'll be better. Okay, So, so we've got to trust him. In it. And I mean that in every way I can mean that. You've got to trust him with everything. Okay, so what I haven't really explained yet is uh, to this point is that I'm basing this message around three verses of, in the Bible which describe the essence of Christmas. Okay, so quick test from what I've said so far. What's the essence of the message of Christmas? At least as far as Christians are concerned anyway. I did slip it in there. What's the essence of the meaning of Christmas? Yeah, so God with us, yeah. The Word became flesh. Yep. The Word became flesh. So that's the first verse of the three, okay? John 1, 14. Here's the second one. So it's going over to Colossians. So just one verse. Colossians chapter 1, verse 19. For in Him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. So that is in Him, in Jesus, that human being from Nazareth in Galilee, who's a real person, in Him the fullness... It's the, the completeness, the entirety of God, nothing's left out, was pleased to dwell. 
So it pleased God to humble himself in this way. And that word pleased there is the same word that God the Father used when they were on the Mount of Transfiguration and you know, God said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. So it's, it's not simply the idea that you know, something fits in his plan so he's pleased, you know, oh, that, that's alright, I'm allowing it. It's, it's, that's definitely part of it, but it's far stronger than that. It's, it actually warms God's heart to do it. It it's, gives him pleasure. That's the same kind of root word. It's a bit like the illustration I gave at Carol's two weeks ago. You know, if, if God is going to know his creations, he's going to have to become just like them. So like the man in the story I gave at that point, who realized he would need to become a bird in order to help, help them uh, along in what he wanted them to do. So in the same way God knew, all along by the way, he knew, that he would have to stoop down and, and become a man if we were to be rescued from our own sin and rebellion. So what this tells us is that he was happy to do it. He was pleased. It, it warmed his heart to be able to become human and do that. Now why? Why would God do that? Any idea? Must, there's one main drive why he did it. Love. Yes, love. God is love. It cost him dearly. Don't forget that, okay? So God becoming human and dying is no small sacrifice in the infinite, or for the infinite God. But he did it in love and out of love. Now, that might sound double Dutch, in love and out of love, but the reason God did it was out of love since his, he is love and therefore he's the source of love. So that's, in that sense it's out of from him. And the end goal is for a love relationship. So it's also for coming back in love. You know, so it starts and ends with love. And love in the middle too, by the way. So yeah, <laughs> It's the whole thing. So it's all pleasing to God because it's, it's all about love. It's who he is. Right. Does that make some sense? Yeah. Because never doubt God's love. Okay, so I do feel I just need to give an explanation of the water picture I've got up there because we need to be careful uh, that we don't think that God is the water and the humanity of Jesus is the glass that the water goes into. Okay. Now I might just be a bit pedantic, but I just want to explain this. So um, some people would say, like, the water and the glass are separate things. No. Now, this is getting into a deep topic called hypostatic union. Don't freak out, but um, we just... We need to try and get to the bottom of it here. Actually, no, we, what I'm saying is we don't need to get to the bottom of it here because it's uh, one of those things like the Trinity which you can't really fully explain. We just can't grasp it. But just be aware that in Jesus, the glass and the water are all one thing. Okay, That's what I'm trying to say. It's heresy to say that Jesus only became God when the Holy Spirit came upon him. There's some who try and teach that. Or that he was in any way part God and part man. That's also incorrect. No, he was and still is fully God and fully man. And if you think about it, that's the only way that the fullness of God can dwell in Jesus, right? Because if he's part God and part man, then he's not all God. If you try and break him up in any way, okay? But no, in Jesus Christ, goodness and humanness are fully and completely and uniquely, okay, there's no other one like him, integrated into one person forever. So you might say, okay, well, that's great, Dave. Thanks very much, but that, well, how does that help me? Well, it helps you and me in the greatest way possible. It tells us who our eternal saviour is. There's no one else. That's pretty important information, isn't it? Yeah. Because this truth of Jesus being both fully God and fully man means that he is the only possible bridge between God and mankind. So if after the fall... We had heaven and earth separated. I don't know if you can see the little people in there. A little bit. That's us at the bottom. Us bunch of misfits. <laughs> so, yeah, so there was a separation, okay? We fell and separated. So then only God, we, we can't go up, so only God in heaven reaching down will be able to bridge that gap, okay? We can do nothing to go up. And so Jesus became that bridge, fully God and fully man. Because only God, like I said, can bridge that gap. But only a human can save mankind by being a sacrifice. 
And just for those who might want to quibble with the theology of my colouring of Jesus there, yes, there is theology in the colouring of Jesus there. I'll just tell you the column is all yellow and all green at the same time, all right? There's a bit of green all the way up and a bit of yellow all the way down. Okay, so he's fully God, fully man. It's just hard to convey with the resources that we have. But anyway, don't lose sight of the main point. That bridge spanning from heaven to earth, there is like the arm of God reaching down, reaching down to save us in love. And those who respond in faith and turn from the word from, from the world to God will cross that bridge and the mighty hand of God will will bring them to himself. That's what he's doing. So the fullness of God is in Jesus. Jesus is the personification of all those great attributes of God. So yes, Jesus did restrain some of his capacities as God voluntarily for a time while he was here. Like we said, he was limited to time and space. But that never reduced his deity. Because his deity, the fact that he is God, can never ever be taken away from an uncreated creator, right? It's not like a, a t-shirt that he puts on with God written across the, the front and he can just take it off and you can be God for a little while. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. Um, for instance, like some at a basketball stadium, they put on the black and white shirt, all of a sudden they're a referee, okay? So that's how it happens with that. But it's not like that. God is God and he can never not be God because his deity is fundamental to who he is. Okay, so let's look now at the third and final verse. For today, and it was in our reading, so in Matthew 1 there, and we read a chunk there, we'll go from verse 22 and read 22 and 23. So it's in the context, context of the birth of Jesus, the story of the birth of Jesus. Matthew writes, All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgins shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So he's quoting from Isaiah, the, the prophet there is Isaiah, chapter 7, verse 14, which actually seems a bit weird at first glance, actually, um, because uh, just to put that quote in a nutshell for you, um, or in, a, in some little bit of context, this was God speaking to Ahaz, who was king of Judah back in about the 700s BC. He saw Syria was uniting with the northern kingdom of Israel and planned to take over Judah. That's the southern kingdom and obviously Ahaz would be in the firing line there. He'd probably get killed in that process. So he was a bit worried but the prophet Isaiah came to Ahaz and told him that God had promised that this would not happen. He wouldn't be invaded, at least at that point. And then God did something pretty unusual. He offered Ahaz to ask for a sign to prove that his word was true. But Ahaz, who was probably feigning humility because he wasn't really a very godly king, he refused, claiming he wouldn't put God to the test. It was a very pious thing to do. So we'll just go and read from Isaiah chapter 7. So we'll, a little bit of quick background there. So Isaiah 7, 10 to 14. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. This is Isaiah speaking God's words to Ahaz. But Ahaz said, I will not ask and I will not put the Lord to the test. And he said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgins shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. So that's that quote that we saw in Matthew. So we see there the sign is something that Ahaz will never see because it happens over 700 years later. But you need to keep in mind, as king of Judah, he represented the people of Israel. So, well, Judah specifically, sorry. So God is really saying this to the house of David as a whole, which is what verse 13 implies there. So even though the throne of David would not exist at the time of the fulfilling of this prophecy, his descendants still would. Joseph was one of them. So God is telling them to keep watching. And he says there, they were, you know, they were really ticking him off, wearying him, it says there, because the line of kings after David basically got worse and, and worse as far as God was concerned. It wasn't totally linear, but you know, there's a few good ones, but mostly it got worse and worse. But God had a promise to keep that he made to David nearly 300 years earlier, that the greatest king would come through his family. 
So no matter how messed up the royal line got, and it got very messed up, God had made a promise. And so God would keep that promise because God keeps his promises. And his promise was Jesus. Except that's not... Well, what was the name of the son there? It was not Jesus, Emmanuel. Now, was Jesus ever called Emmanuel to his face? I doubt it. Probably not. So what's the point of this name? Well, this is where good old Matthew helps us out. So we go back to Matthew there. Um, because he tells us that the name Emmanuel means God with us. And so God is not giving Ahaz his actual you know, birth certificate name. He's giving him Jesus' title, you could say. So Jesus, whose name in Hebrew is Yeshua, which means uh, Yahweh saves, or Yahweh the true God saves. This Jesus is God in person, as we've been talking about. He's come to live amongst human beings. He was literally God with us. So whatever Jesus did and said was what God did and said. The passions and the priorities and the goals that Jesus has are the passions and priorities and goals that God has. So we see here in this name Emmanuel is a confirmation of Jesus' deity again. Because he wasn't only called you know, God's messenger to us or God's gift to us or you know, blessing with us or whatever. All those things are true but they aren't nearly as compelling and clear as, as this you know, saying God with us. That's, that says it all. And it's exactly what we sing every Christmas. And I'll just draw our attention now to that well-known carol, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, which we will sing as our closing song today, actually. And so I just want to highlight some of the words to show what we're singing has some great depth of meaning. Because so often we sing songs and, and you know, the words just sort of come out and we don't really switch our brains on. Is that, is that just me or is that other people do that too? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I hate the fact that I do that, but we are human, but that's why it's good to really sometimes focus on the words and really think about what they mean. So, so this is the idea of the incarnation of God that we're going to look at in the, this part of the words here. So the incarnation just means to become physical. Right? Chili con carne means meat, flesh. Okay, So it's becoming flesh. So incarnation, it's poetically described in this carol here. In verse, This is part of verse 2 of it. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see... Hail the incarnate deity. Pleased, remember we talked about pleased, as man, with men to dwell. Jesus, our Emmanuel. Can you see how a lot of the themes I've just been talking about are just in that little section? It's just it's half of verse 2. Uh, I didn't actually plan that that many things were going to be in there, but there you go. I think God had some ideas that he wants to show us that this consistent message is what Christmas is all about. It's all about the absolute miracle of God becoming incarnate, becoming a man. So that's why the message of Christmas is so important. And that's why we like to give each other gifts. Because it's in perfect harmony with the heart of giving that the Father God has for us. And he's shown in how he sent his son as a gift for us to save us and show us the way home. And drag us home in some cases almost. And that's news worth sharing, isn't it? Are we like herald angels? Are we herald people? Telling the good news to the folks we meet. It was certainly something the Apostle John was super keen to make known to those he was teaching. Because we saw before how he started off his gospel, the gospel of John there, with an amazing description of Jesus as the word, the logos. Well, guess what? He does a similar thing in his first and biggest letter to the churches who was he was instructing at the time. That's a, 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 another book. He, had, he wrote three more books. Or actually, he wrote four more books in the Bible. Three had his name on them. One John, two John, and three John. But I'm talking about the book of one John, the first one. So as we approach an end this morning, we're just going to read the first few verses of the, the book of one John. I want you to see that many of those themes are in there again. Okay, So one John, one verse one. So it's down near the back of the Bible. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. 
So we see there the idea of his being there from the beginning, right? So you know in his gospel book it started out, in the beginning was the word. And so we see that the Logos is there again in verse 1, isn't it? The Logos, concerning the word of life. And he's going to great pains to show us that this word, this Logos, is flesh and blood. You can hardly explain it any more. <laughs> How many ways can you say that he, he was physical, right? Because part of what John was actually doing in this, this book, in, his, in 1 John, was to fight against this false idea that Jesus was just a phantom or, a, or an illusion. You know, that when he walked, he left no footprints kind of thing. That's what some people describe it as. So that's what he was trying to fight against. But So John is emphatically denying that heresy. No, Jesus is really God in flesh. He's seen him and he's touched him. He spent three years with him. In verse 2. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. See, Jesus is eternal life. He doesn't just have eternal life, he is eternal life. That's why we have to be in Christ for us to have it in ourselves. Or we could just as equally say, have him for ourselves. He is the eternal life from God himself. Because you see, John says again how he was with the Father. Okay, So that's the same kind of phrasing again. Right alongside God. And he himself was also God, wasn't he? He's was with God and he was God. And he again is making it very clear that he knew him very well. John did. He had sat under his ministry for three years and had touched him and spoken with him and been loved by him. Because you know, John, in his book, he often called himself the beloved disciple, you know, the disciple whom Jesus loved. So he certainly knew all about the love of Jesus. Which, as we have said, is really the whole point, right? Yep. The love relationship between God and man. And from that comes the fellowship between those who are in that relationship with God. Verse 3. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim to you, also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. You see, we as a, as a church, as Collie Church of Christ, are a bunch of different people from a bunch of different backgrounds and a whole lot of unique stories. But those are not the things which unite us necessarily. Some of those things may do, but you know, they add colour and they, but they also add complexities to our relationships. But they're not what hold us together. It's only Jesus Christ who holds us together. You might say binds us together if you want to go back to the song from the 70s. And it's testimonies and writings from apostles like John which give us these words of life in written form. So they're enough for us. Since God's Spirit works through these words we read, he, he unites us under the name of Christ. That's the church. That's why we meet together and we seek him together. He is unifying and his spirit gives us eternal life that we need, obviously, and the spiritual eyes to see this truth. And his truth includes the fact that he is God in flesh. He is Emmanuel, God with us. So that's what I hope really comes home to us again this Christmas. In all the family do's and present giving and, and eating, and there's a lot of eating, and everything else, let's not lose sight of that greatest gift of all, God himself coming as a baby in Jesus. <laughs>